It's my pleasure today to welcome Professor Susie Mote as our speaker. Um, she's Professor of Behavioral Science at Warwick Business School, where she directs the Data Science Lab with her colleague Tobias Price. She's also a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute. Susie's research investigates whether data on our usage of the internet from sources such as Google, Twitter, Wikipedia, and online games can help us to measure and predict human behavior. I would like to remind the audience to please use the Twitter hashtag, um, hashtag Civica Data Science, if you're tweeting about this event. I would also like to remind you that this event is being recorded. And if we don't experience any catastrophic technical difficulties, then we will also publish this as a video or a podcast. And finally, we will be taking questions and answers through the Q&A function on Zoom. So if you would like to ask a question, please do add it to the Q&A at any time. And towards the end of the event, well, after um, Susie has finished her presentation, we'll be addressing those questions um, after her talk. With that introduction, I will turn it over to Susie, who will be talking about understanding beautiful places and well-being with AI. My name is Susie Moat. Um, I'm a professor of behavioral science and a fellow of the Alan Turing Institute the UK's um, National Institute for Data Science and AI. Now, my background is a mixture of computer science and psychology. And for many years, people used to tell me that this was a really strange combination. I really need to point out to all of you that over the past few years, things have really changed and increasingly, everything we do generates data. Now, at Warwick Business School, I have the huge honour of directing the data science lab with my colleague Tobias Price. And in our data science lab, we're interested in data from the internet. So data on things people are searching for on Google, data on photos that people post to sites like Instagram or Flickr, data on games that people play online. Now, over the years, we've spent a lot of time trying to understand whether we can use this data to predict what people are going to do in the real world next, or to see whether we can measure human behavior that was previously really time consuming or expensive to capture. But we've also spent some time looking at whether we can use this data and a little bit of AI to measure things that we simply didn't have any way of measuring before. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So here in Great Britain, uh, we're not known for having the most wonderful weather, but despite our slightly unreliable weather, we do have some really beautiful locations. So consider this picture. This is a picture of the Lake District in the north of England. Now, I really love the Lake District. I grew up near there. And I used to really enjoy spending time there because being in this beautiful location just used to make me feel better. Now up there in the top right hand corner, that's Chinooki Saracenia. So Chinooki recently completed a PhD in our lab, excellent PhD, a fantastic researcher. But before Chinooki came to work with us, she had a really interesting career and um, working in design. So Chinooki, had a real sense for how the way that things look might impact upon our everyday experience of the world and, and how happy and healthy we feel. So Chinooki, Tobias and I, we were looking at photos like this and we were looking at all the photographs that are shared online these days. And we were wondering, is there not some way that we can use this new um, volume of photographic data to get some quantitative insights into the relationship between how a place looks and how healthy we feel. Now, despite my stories about the Lake District, uh, we will all realise that, unfortunately, we don't spend the majority of our time on holiday. And um, so really what matters perhaps the most is how the, what the relationship is between um, the way that the places we live in look and how healthy we feel. Now, lucky for us, 
um, the Office for National Statistics had some good data on this. It comes from the census. So the census, is, as um, those of you in the UK uh, might realise, as we've recently filled a new one out, has a question on it, which it asks you to rate how healthy you, you, you feel. And so um, we can take data from this on people who've reported um, bad or very bad health. And um, we can look at where that occurs more frequently. Now, you might realise, um, unfortunately, uh, people who are older tend to report that their health, health is worse. There is actually also a gender difference. So, so men tend to report um, worse health than, than women as well. So we need to take these factors into account. And um, But once we've normalised for these characterizations, characteristics of the local population, um, then we can plot this data, plug it into a model. And if we map it, it looks like this. So lighter areas on this map are areas where people reported poorer health. And darker areas are areas where people reported better health. If you look at that map, you'll notice some patterns fairly, fairly quickly. So you'll see there's lighter areas around some of our bigger cities in, in England. So London, um, Birmingham, Liverpool, for example. So it seems that people are reporting that their health is, is worse when, when they live in, in cities. So we've got this national scale data on how healthy people feel, but how can we get a similar sort of scale of data on how attractive the environment is? Well, the answer to this question, luckily, came to us in the shape of um, a game called Scenic or Not. So Scenic or Not is a game that was created by an organization called My Society back in 2009. I'm very proud to say it now lives in our data science lab at Warwick Business School. And Scenic or Not shows you pictures like this and asks you to rate them. So if you think this is a very scenic picture, you can click on 10. If you think it's not scenic at all, you can click on one or you can pick something in the middle. The photos in turn come from another online project called Geograph. So in Geograph, um, you get points for uploading photographs in as many kilometers squares as possible um, across Great Britain and indeed Ireland. So on the back of Geograph and Scenic or Not, we have um, over 1.5 million votes for over 200,000 locations across Great Britain. So we can plot that data as well, and it looks like this. Um, so here on this map, you can see that darker areas are areas that were rated as more scenic. Lighter areas are areas that are rated as less scenic. So I love this map because up there in the north, that's um, you can see the Lake District up there, colored a beautiful dark purple. So it seems that people agree with me, it's a, a lovely location. You can see that Cornwall in the south of England also does very well. Um, you can see again, London, for example, down in the, the southeast is colored in a lighter color. It hasn't been rated as scenic as the Lake District. We, we might have expected as much. But we, we have this data on, on this national scale um, that really gets us behind beyond these very, very high level instincts that London might be less scenic than the Lake District, for example. So what we wondered is, well, what would happen if um, we combined these two data sets? And, and what we find is that people who live in more scenic locations report their health to be better. Now, if you've just been looking at those last two maps and you've been listening to what I've been telling you, um, I would expect you are now sitting there thinking, well, is that not insanely trivial? I mean, we've just seen cities are places where people have reported their health to be um, worse. We've also seen that cities are um, rated as less scenic than the Lake District, what a surprise. Um, is this not just about whether people live in the cities or, 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 or the country? We of course wondered the same. So we split England into urban, suburban and rural areas. And we found that even if you look in those areas on their own, so you just look at urban areas across England, for example, the relationship still holds. So you still see that people who live in more scenic locations 
report their health to be better. Now, even with that out of the way, you might think, well, yes, but there are other things that might explain this. If you think about who lives where in, in, in cities, you might rightly expect that people um, who are on uh, much lower incomes are not going to be able to choose to live in the most scenic locations in a city. Um, and they're also likely to be the people who report worse health. Now, thankfully, we have loads of data on these sorts of socioeconomic characteristics. So we plugged in information on income and other various measures of, of deprivation. And, and while you do see um, that, unfortunately, income is indeed um, related to, to health, it is not enough to explain this relationship. Another thing you might still wonder is, well, you know, OK, fine, we, we've got we've got a few things out of the way here, but you might agree with me that the Lake District is, is very beautiful, but it's unlikely that you disagree that it's very green. So you might ask, have we not just found a really complicated way of measuring how green an area is? We did wonder this too, um, but thankfully we had a way to check this because measuring how green an area is, is something that has been much simpler historically than getting data on how scenic people think places are. Because you can measure how green somewhere is by just taking some aerial imagery from above the country. Um, and so by analyzing that aerial imagery, you can create a map of green space. So if we plot that, we've got that on the left, um, you can see where, which areas of England are greener um, than other areas of England. So for example, we do indeed see that the Lake District is on the whole fairly green and London is not in comparison. But if we put that next to the map of how scenic areas are, you'll see that while there are some striking similarities, these maps are not exactly the same. So for example, um, towards the east of England, we start to find some areas that rate fairly high in terms of green space, but are not seeing quite the same boost in terms of their scenic ratings. So in particular in the light of all that's been written about green space and health in, in the past, we wondered, well, what would give us the best explanation of differences in how healthy people report themselves to be? Would it be the scenic data? Would it be the green space data? Would it be both together? And so we built three models. One model that just used the scenicness data, one model that just used the green space data, and another model that used both the scenicness and the green space data. And with all of these models, we put all the income deprivation data um, in as well. And what we wanted to know is, okay, which model of these three looks most probable given the data we, we have. And the, what you can see um, on this graph is a representation of what we infer the probability of these models to be. So um, areas colored just in purple are showing us probability of the model that just uses the scenicness data. Areas colored just in green are showing us probabilities for the model that just uses the green space data, and the stripy areas are the probability of the model that uses both data sets at all, both data sets together. So what you'll notice fairly, fairly rapidly is that hardly any of the bars on this graph are colored in just green. There's very little area colored in just green. And um, so we see from this that there is very little evidence for a model that just uses the green space data and doesn't use the scenic data as well. In fact, when we look at how the models play out for all of England or just urban, just urban, suburban, just rural areas, you'll see that in urban areas, by this analysis, we actually find um, the greatest probability for the model that just uses the, the scenicness data. In any case, this, there really seems to be very little evidence that we can ignore that scenicness data if we want to get the best explanation um, of the data on how healthy people report themselves to be. Now, something I should make super clear here is that as much as I would like to be reporting a 
causal relationship here. That's not something we can claim on the basis of, of these results. We are very excited to see that we have evidence of something that has historically just felt like a nice to have, that the place looks attractive and how healthy people report themselves to be. But we don't know for sure what the direction is um, in that relationship. So one thing, for example, that we have not yet ruled out is that people who feel healthier suddenly decide to go and move to a more scenic location. So that's one of the things that we still need to work on um, as we work our way down our, our long to-do list. However, if for a moment we suppose there were a causal relationship, even then, even then we'd still have a lot of questions to answer. Primarily, well, why? Why, why would living in a more scenic area lead you to report yourself as healthier? Might it be that if you live in a more scenic location, uh, you're more inclined to go and do more exercise? Or might it be like my feelings when I went to the Lake District, that being in a more scenic location just made you, makes you feel happier. And because you feel happier, you also feel healthier. Now, happiness is another interesting topic in terms of measurement. It is something that has also historically been somewhat challenging to measure at scale. So there have been, over the years, many experiments done um, with small groups of people where you can put them in multiple scenarios and you can measure how happy they are before and how happy afterwards by giving them questionnaires. Um, but you do tend to only have a small number of people in those sorts of traditional experimental setups. An alternative would be um, huge long running surveys of, of which there are a few and um, that ask lots of people um, how happy they're feeling. But then those have traditionally run on something like a yearly basis. So it's been more like a measure of yearly life satisfaction. How happy are you with your life right now? Rather than the sort of you know, minute to minute changes we might expect in happiness when people move through the world um, that, that we live in. So given these constraints on previous data on happiness, we were really delighted to start working with George McCarran um, from the University of Sussex. So George had developed an app called Mappiness. So Mappiness, if you installed it, um, would ping you a couple of times a day and it would ask you how happy you were feeling, how relaxed you were feeling, how awake you were feeling. And it would also ask you some other questions such as um, who are you with right now? And, and what are you doing? So on the back of um, mappiness, we have measurements for huge numbers of, of, of people. Um, and that allows us to start to see some uh, simple patterns. So for example, we can find out, answer a long standing question, which day of the week makes us happiest? So given that I'm giving a talk on a Wednesday, I'm not sure this graph is really working in my favor, but I can tell you all, We've only got a couple of days to wait until things start feeling a little better. Um, I've maybe picked a better month. September's not too bad, could, could be worse. I'm hoping that that is working in my favour for the reception of, of, of this talk. We won't look a few months ahead, that's rather more depressing. Um, but simple patterns about the weeks and the months of the year aside, this data allows us to start answering um, more questions um, than we would otherwise have been able to answer um, about how people feel as they move through different environments. So scenic or not gives us the data on how scenic different places are, and mappiness gives us the data on how happy people are when they're in those locations. So what we find is it is indeed the case that when people are in more scenic locations, they do report themselves to be happier. And crucially, this holds if we take all sorts of other things into account. I should emphasize um, that goes way beyond the variables I have crammed onto this graph. I didn't want to make you squint too much. So these are just a few examples. Um, so let me give you some of the examples off this graph. Um, so you can see that the boost that you might expect um, in your happiness from moving from an area rated as the least scenic to an area in the top scenic categories. 
um, is about the same as the boost you might expect from listening to music or from talking and chatting and socializing, roughly, roughly speaking. We see at the same time um, an inverse effect of um, traveling or commuting, I think reflecting on the few um, positives that have come out of the, the, the past few months. None of us really like, like doing that. But crucially, this effect holds, even if we look at whether people are in a green space, whether we look at whether people are in urban, rural or suburban areas, or whether people are in a natural area or a built up area, like the areas in which many of us, many of us live. And so uh, weather, plenty of other things in there too, if you're, um, if you're interested, but so with mappiness, it's really possible to try and rule out many other um, competing explanations. So we had these results that it seemed that people were reporting themselves um, to be healthier if they lived in a more scenic location. They were reporting themselves to be happier if they were spending time in a more scenic location. And so we took these to planners and they said, well, that is great, but what makes an area more scenic? And we said, oh, and we looked at our pile of 200,000 photographs, found some that had high ratings and said, oh, we think people like bridges. Because obviously we spent all this time doing such quantitative work at such a large scale, that is not the kind of inference you want to be making. So we acknowledged our own personal shortcomings that we were never going to be able to work through that pile of photographs ourselves and drew upon um, one, of the one of the advances of artificial intelligence over the past few years, specifically convolutional neural networks. So at MIT, a convolutional neural network had been created called Places CNN, which was thankfully much better than we were at processing lots of photographs and making notes on what, they, what, was, what was in these photographs. So for example, if we put this photograph in, we get some information on the kind of um, category of scene this is. So you can see some fairly high ratings here for valley, for lake natural. And we also get some information on um, the scene attributes. So we've got a large score for natural light here. And in total, by putting our hundreds of thousands of photographs through places CNN, we got 300, we got over 300 features for each photograph. And this made it possible to take the data on those features and plug that into a model to help us understand well, which features are associated with people rating photographs more highly. Now, um, we need to take some care in building a model of, of this kind because we're going to see that things like valley and, and lake and mountain may be correlated. And so we, we build a regression model that um, can better manage these sorts of correlations called an elastic net. So let's have a look at what we find. So if we look at the initial results, well, there may be what we might expect. Turns out I'm not the only one who likes lakes. So photographs with lakes get a big boost in their score. Photographs with valleys too get a big boost. At the same time, photographs of industrial areas not scoring so highly, um, nor are photographs which contain buildings that the neural network thinks look like hospitals. So if you look at those results to start, you think, well, I, I might have been able to work that out myself. Um, you know, natural green areas seem to be doing well, built up areas not doing so well. But if we dig into the data a little more closely and we consider um, urban built up areas that, that many of us live in, we see that the story is a little bit more complicated than this. So for example, some built elements um, such as cottages and other buildings with characters such as castles, they do also boost the, um, the, the, the scenic rating of, of a scene. Um, so it's not just these green areas. Similarly, viaducts to our relief, bridges, aqueducts too. Turns out people really do like bridges, so we weren't that far off. And they also boost the rating of a scene. And at the same time, um, it seems that not all green space is equal. So trees, for example, will boost the rating of a scene. But areas of flat grass, like athletic fields, for example, um, are usually, when everything else is taken into consideration, um, associated with a decrease in, in, in the rating. So this helps us start to understand why those maps 
of scenicness and green space didn't actually completely match up when we were looking at them um, earlier on. And it also emphasizes um, if we want to think about policy in this area, there really is difference between different areas of green space. We can't just focus on how green areas are. So we've managed to use a neural network to help us crack this conundrum of well, what was actually making people consider an area more scenic, but something was still bugging us. Namely, uh, we only had one photograph um, for every kilometre square, because that's the way um, geograph works and the way that scenic or not was originally set up. But within those kilometre squares, geograph actually has many more photographs. And in particular, in urban areas, it would be really useful to have denser ratings than just one measurement for every kilometre square. So we wondered, well, you know, if we've got a neural network to tell us what's in the photograph, can we not train it to also estimate how scenic the photograph is? The answer is, well, yes, we can. So we took places CNN and we told it using something called transfer learning, stop trying to tell us what you think is in the picture and learn instead using the scenic or not data um, how scenic the photograph is. So this is a map of um, part of London. Um, so on this map, blue dots represent areas that the network thought was most attractive. Red dots represent areas that it didn't like so much. And if you look at the patterns, you'll, you'll, you'll notice something fairly rapidly. So the neural network's drawn blue dots all over green spaces. So it seems it, it really likes green spaces. And indeed, um, if we look more closely, we can see areas such as Hampstead Heath have received really high ratings. But we do find if we um, look into the photographs, it isn't that simple. Um, again, as our elastic net analysis had told us, some um, in, the, in the top rated photographs by the CNN, we find that there's also built, um, built areas in there too. So areas such as um, Big Ben and indeed um, the, the Tower of London. So places that we all recognize and, and, um, and love. So using scenic or not, and um, some AI, so crowdsourcing and AI, it's been possible to infer um, that um, scenic places aren't just green places, um, and they're also not just natural places. But importantly, it seems that they're not just a nice to have either. And we do have some initial evidence that there are potentially consequences of how scenic places are for our, our health. And, and our, our happiness. Now, we've got a little bit of time left, so I thought I would also just tell you about some other work that we've done in our lab um, around the area of health. Now, over the years, we have done loads of work with data on what people are searching for on Google, so um, looking at per capita GDP, so finding people who live in, in um, countries with a higher per capita GDP, Google for more information about the future, looking at whether we can use Google Trends data to anticipate um, subsequent um, stock market moves. Um, but beyond this economic work, we've also uh, looked at what we can do with this data in the area of health. And this might remind many of you of a very well-known story in social data science, um, namely the story of Google flu trends. So quick recap for those of you who aren't already extremely familiar um, with this story. So let's start with the flu. Um, I'm sure, unfortunately, many of you have had the flu. Um, it's not a particularly pleasant experience. Uh, you, know, you feel pretty awful for, for a few days. Um, but generally, most of us will recover from, 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 from that experience um, as, as non-enjoyable um, as it is. However, for more vulnerable people, flu is more dangerous, it, it can lead to hospitalisation and to death. And so this is a reason for which doctors are um, really keen to have a good overview of how many people have the flu um, at any one, one point in time. Now, the problem is that traditionally data on how many people have the flu um, is not available as rapidly as you might hope. That's because if somebody gets the flu, then they need to go to the doctor to say, well, I've got the flu. 
The doctor then tells a central authority, I think this person has the flu, and all of this takes a while. So engineers at Google realize, well, maybe we can do something useful here. Probably if somebody has the flu, then they Google for flu symptoms or, or, or related medicine. And we've got access to that data immediately. So maybe um, by finding relevant searches that go up as flu cases go up, we could help generate a quicker indicator of how many people have the flu. So this looked like a really great success story to start with. So if you look at this graph, um, this is gra um, data for um, the US. And um, so the flu data comes from the, um, from the CDC in the, in the US. And so that's the official data on how many people have got the flu. And the black dot and line shows you the Google data on how many, or Google estimate rather, of how many people have got the flu. And you can see that the black dot is generally ahead of the red dot because of the delay in the official data coming through. Um, and the red dot does generally, um, for the period shown here, tend to follow the black dot. So this looked like a, a great success story. Um, we could use Google Trends data to generate quicker estimates of how many people um, have the flu until this happened very famously. So in the winter of 2012-2013, Google put out an estimate that over 10% of the US population had flu-like illness. And then when the official, you can see that in red, um, in blue, you can see the official data and the CDC data, and um, that's when that came through, it was closer to 6%. So there was really quite a huge discrepancy. Um, and so there was loads of coverage about this, you know, ah, oh, this big data, we shouldn't use it. We're getting everything wrong. We need to go back to the traditional ways of, 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 of doing things um, because it's not reliable. It, in what people thought, one of the explanations for what might have happened was that um, there was a lot of discussion about flu that winter. And so understandably, maybe people started Googling for the flu when they didn't actually have it, hence sending this, this indicator off the rails um, a little. Now, a lot of people will tell you that's the end of the story and it just didn't work. But um, Tobias and I, at the time, as I explained, um, we'd been working with Google data a lot. And so we looked at this and we thought, well, you know, is that really the case that it, it just doesn't work, that there's nothing in the data? That seemed really unlikely to us given our previous experience. So we wondered whether it was maybe more about how the data was being analyzed. And indeed, we realized, well, there's a couple of things that you could improve here. So the initial Google flu trends indicator was based just on data on how many people were searching for the flu. Now, the data on how many people, the official data on how many people have the flu was delayed but you can imagine that data on how many people had the flu a week or a couple of weeks ago probably is going to tell us something about how many people have the flu right now. So it seems that really you'd want to feed that into your estimates too. The other thing we realize is, well, if you look at this graph, you can start to see um, before the big erroneous spike, um, in the run up to that really high estimate, you can see that the estimates have gone a bit off, um, off the, the mark already, that there, that there are overestimates um, in the run-up to that. And actually, what was happening here is the model wasn't being retrained as new data came in. And so that seems like we're also missing a trick. You know, people will change their search behavior. People will start searching for things for different reasons. And so we want to stay on top of this and integrate it into, into our models. And so we had a look, OK, well, what happens if we retrain the model every week and we um, use data, recent data, albeit delayed data, on how many people have the flu? And what we find is that then, including that data on how many people have been Googling for flu-related terms, um, does actually help us improve estimates of how many people um, have the flu um, in comparison to a, a good now casting model that doesn't use this data, we can reduce the errors by between 16 and 53%. That's quite a big um, span of, of, um, of improvements, but so that's about the, uh, the, the, the training window that you use. So the improvement varies depending on how long you, you train the model, the model for. So we concluded from this that it, it really was the case that it, we shouldn't be throwing out the Google data. It, Throwing out the Google data would really be throwing out the baby with the bathwater. 
Now, it wasn't the data that was at fault, it's the methodology. It's really important that we analyze these new data sources with appropriate methodologies. Now, the past one and a half years has reminded us all, unfortunately, that flu is really not the only infectious um, disease that causes us problems. Um, besides COVID-19, you know, there are many other infectious diseases that have caused major problems for countries around the world for some time. And one example of this is um, mosquito-borne diseases, for example, dengue, Zika, and, and chikungunya. So chikungunya um, is a disease that has been a problem um, in Brazil over the past few years, 100,000 to 250,000 cases um, per year. And it's a horrible disease. So if you catch chikungunya, you get horrible joint pain, you get high fever, and in about 25% of acute cases, um, catching, ha having an acute chikungunya infection, it's estimated, can lead to things like paralysis. So it's really not good. You, you don't want to catch, um, you don't want to catch chikungunya. So the problem is that um, data on chikungunya is also delayed. So here's, here's a plot of how bad chikungunya cases have been each week um, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil over the past um, few years. And so you can see uh, there was an epidemic in 2019 with up to 3,000 cases in just the city of Rio um, every, every week. But this data takes a long time to come in. It's, it's even worse, unfortunately, than what we saw with the flu data. And um, it can be delayed by, by some weeks. And so if you were a policymaker and you wanted to look at how many people had had chikungunya in the past week in um, Rio, and you just looked at the raw data, then this is what you'd see. So this is the cases entered into the official system by the end of each week. You can see just a small fraction of how many people have actually had um, chikungunya. As I said, this is unfortunately worse than the flu situation. So with the flu, we were looking at a delay of one or two weeks, and then we've got complete flu data. That is not what happens here. So if we look at, look at that peak in 2019, so the week commencing um, 26th of May 2019, by the end of that week, there'd be nearly 3,000 cases of chikungunya in, in, in Rio. Um, you can see uh, that by the end of that week, fewer than 20% of those cases had been entered into the disease surveillance system. If we fast forward another eight weeks, unfortunately, we can see, well, the situation's improved, but not that much. Um, so we're still at that point missing over 25% of the, of the cases. And you can see it trails back. If you look at that light red area, you can see all the way, even, even um, in July, we've got data missing all the way back to, to, to April. And similarly, so if we try another eight weeks, we can see, well, at that point, we've got most of the, the data for the week commencing 26th of May, 2019. There's still, after a whole 16 weeks, in September instead of May, there's still 70% of cases um, missing. So we were wondering, well, you know, given that we'd shown that you could use Google data to improve the speed and accuracy um, of the estimates of how many people have the flu. Might it work with chikungunya as well? Because there's a real problem here. Um, so here's the, again, the data on how many people had chikungunya each week in, in, in Rio. So we looked at, okay, how many people, or what, what, is, an, what is an index, what is an indicator of um, the number of searches for chikungunya um, each week in Rio de Janeiro. So we, we can't access that data on a city basis. Google doesn't routinely make it available on a city basis, but we can see it at state basis. And you can see that the peaks are in roughly the right place. They're not necessarily always exactly the right size, but it looks like there is at least a relationship um, between the Google data and the official data. So we thought, okay, can we build a model then, which will help us address this problem that data on how many people have got chikungunya is, is so delayed. And we all know from the past 18 months how important it is to have up-to-date data on how a disease is spreading so that interventions can be made in a timely fashion. We don't see disease spread more than it needs to. We don't see, we don't see more extensive interventions than would have otherwise been, been needed. And so what we did is we, we learned again from the Google Three Trends um, experience. 
we built a model that would we retrain every week and we built a model that draws on the official data as well as the Google data. The bit that's different under the bonnet with, with this model is that we have to treat the official data differently. So as I said, we can't just say, well, the data is delayed by one week or two weeks. We need to build a more complex model where we estimate, well, how many cases do we think will have been delayed by one week? How many cases do we think will have been delayed by two weeks, by three weeks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what we do underneath. And that work is um, based on some, some excellent work by our colleague, um, Leon Bastos. So then, with um, to be, so Tobias and I, with our PhD students, um, Sam Miller and Giovanni um, Mitzi, and with our excellent collaborators in Rio de Janeiro, um, Claudia Codesu, Flavio Coelho, and Leo Bastos and Marcel Gomez, um, we built this model. And um, using Google data, which is available immediately at the end of each week, um, and this is what we found. So we found that we could indeed improve the estimates of the model. So if you look at that blue line, you can see what's much higher than that, that red, um, the, the red initial data was on the, the previous graph. We've got much closer to the official um, data, which is shown as, as, as blue circles here, blue and white circles. Now, realistically, policymakers don't actually look at that data when it's just come in after a week. They know it's very incomplete. What they often do is look at what we know about what happened three weeks ago, because that data is more complete. But even in comparison to that sort of heuristic, we see an improvement of 21% with this approach. Or even if we just use um, this, this good model of how many um, cases are delayed by one week, two weeks, and we ignore the Google data. So adding the Google data in still gives us an improvement of 10%. So again, we see that Google data can help us um, with disease surveillance. So a key takeaway I would like to pass on is don't let anybody tell you that Google data doesn't work in, in disease surveillance. It can be really helpful, but it is really important um, that, that we get the, the, the methodology um, correct. So we, um, I've shown you um, how we can use data on what people are looking for on Google, on photos that people upload online, and from data on games that people play online and from mobile apps to help us understand how healthy people are right now, and indeed um, how the environment we live in might be related to our health and our happiness. And these are just a few examples of how in our data science lab at Warwick Business School, um, we've been using data from the internet and the right methodology um, to um, use, see if we can use quicker, uh, more quickly available online data to measure and predict um, behavior in the real world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Susie. That was fascinating. And I can see that you and your colleagues have been extremely active in this area in some very important areas. Um, uh, we've got a number of questions and I'm going to um, take some of those from the Q&A. Um, thank you audience for supplying those. Um, let's start with the question. This is actually a question I had as well. Um, so Philip Porter asks, what was the reasoning for using subjective measures of health rather than objective measures such as life expectancy or perhaps NHS information or other, other objective measures? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, the answer to that was simply that it was the easiest data to get um, hold of at the time. And there is um, well-documented correlations between how healthy people report themselves to be and how healthy they actually are. But you are absolutely right. And um, this is something we're really keen to um, build on and we're working towards at the moment is plugging in more objective um, measures of how healthy um, people are so that we can try and disentangle that effect. So it is, is our result really just about how healthy people feel or is it about how healthy they, they actually are and specific diseases, for example? And so that's, that's something we hope to have more answers on soon. Let me add a nuance to that question. So um, remind me again what the, um, how you got the subjective measures of health. And uh, with mappiness, it's clear there's an app. I've actually used this app myself. There's an app and you get pinged and you're then asked to uh, give a spot answer of how happy you are and the other ways you feel. But what, what, what was the 
the equivalent for the for the self reports of health? It was census data. So in the census, there's a question where you're asked to report on on how healthy you feel, and there's a there's a, a five point scale. And so we look at people who um, pick one of the the lowest two um, choices for how healthy they feel. Okay, great. Um, then. Here's another question from Olga Gasparian. She asked, what about Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland? Did you an analyze scenic scenicness in there as well? Uh, they weren't colored in the first maps. No, really, really good question. Um, so uh, we have scenic data on Scotland, on Wales um, and on Northern Ireland. Totally agree with you. Re um, really interesting question to look at those areas as well. And um, the reason that they were not colored was just the various data sources that we were layering up to do that analysis. Um, so uh, some of them, for example, don't match across England and Scotland. You can get equivalents, but they're, they're, they're not exactly the same. And so we focused on, on England for, 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 for that analysis. But it, it is absolutely true um, that it would be interesting to see how it, it, it might extend um, in other nations uh, using equivalent data sets. Okay, um, great. And then um, another question. So what do you know about the people that use the app, the Mappiness um, app? And what could you say about possible selection bias? If you're feeling really, uh, I know this myself, like sometimes I, if I was in a really bad mood, it would ping me and I would like, oh, stop bothering me. You know, then you wouldn't answer it. But if you're in a, you know, if you're out having a good time, it's like, oh yeah, hey, ping, feeling great. Yes, no, I, I think those points are really valid. Um, there's further points about it was an iPhone app, so you would have had to have an iPhone to install it. That's already going to impose a huge bias on, on the people who, who um, use it. Um, so is the data set biased? Yes, <laughs> it's definitely biased. And George would say, um, would say exactly the same and frequently does. Um, so the, the, it's absolutely true that in interpreting the results, uh, both the people who may have chosen to respond to mappiness and any effects we can think of as to when they would have responded should, should be considered. I think, the although I'm open to uh, you know, any suggestions around this, the first one is more of a concern to me. It seems clear we will have looked at this approach in a certain proportion of the population and some who didn't have an iPhone or hadn't installed mappiness would have been um, excluded and so there's clear extension work to be done there to try and reach um, other people. I'd have to think harder about the effect of whether people bothered to answer or not and exactly how that might confound the final results but it's it's, it's true it's true that it, it's, it's worth considering this but I do think with all of this the data is not perfect you know none of this data is perfect but then I don't recall ever having seen a perfect data set. So I suppose what we're, what we're trying to do is draw on the, the strengths of these um, new data sets. And you see in some of this work, combining it with more traditional survey, um, survey data, for example, so that we can answer questions that we just couldn't get any handle on um, before at this sort of scale without this, this data. But it, it is absolutely true that there's still then uh, limitations that need to be considered. Okay, we've got a question from Teresa Velasco. What was the name of the MIT application that analyzed the photos? Was it was it Places CNN? That's exactly right. Yeah. So Places, if you look up Places 365, um, that will get you to the latest neural networks that they've um, released. And there's also a big image database that, that, that goes along with that. And so yeah, we're definitely worth looking at. Is that a software library that you install and run, or is it service that they provide through some API? But you can, if you want to play with it online, you can, but otherwise you, you would normally just install it your, yourself. It's a, it's a convolutional neural network that you can, you can set up and run. What, did you have any funny stories about how it really got things wrong? I mean, you told the story about the buildings that look like hospitals. Um, any, any other things that you noticed with that? That is no, that's a really, really good question. So we have used this network um, a lot. And um, so you will see it get a little confused um, on occasion. With geograph imagery, 
it tends to perform quite well on, on the whole. I've seen it get more confused with other uh, other data other data sets that don't seem to have the same coverage as as, as geographers. But what we what you do see is that if it um, if it mislabels things uh, like telling you there are windmills in the middle of London that, that you cannot find for the life of you, um, then you can see when you look at the photographs and um, why it thinks there's a windmill there. So there's at least it doesn't tend to be labeling things randomly. It's picked up on some shared visual characteristic where you, you, you can look at that set of photographs and go, okay, I see what you think a windmill is, for example. But, but on the whole, it's, it's, it, it, is, it is very good. But yeah, it's worth, if you want to use it a lot, it's worth playing around with and chucking images at so that you can see um, places where it might get a bit, um, a, a bit confused and come up with amusing, amusing labels for your, for your photographs. Great. Um, we have another question about the photographs um, and how much the quality of the photographs can impact the ability to either classify scenicness or recognize them um, and whether you had to deal with differences um, in, in quality like that. But I'll, I guess also subjectively, um, if I'm taking a picture in London, it might be very different than if I'm hike to the top of the peak district where my whole purpose might be to take a beautiful photograph and maybe i would have gotten up in the morning to see the sunset and gotten the moon's position you know or something like that whereas if i take a photo as i'm in london it may not have been planned for the same scenicness and i was wondering if there's a, a the question pertains to whether there might be some i guess there's two aspects the quality but also the subjective quality Yes, right. So, this, so I think this touches on a really important point that as happy as we are to have these national set size, national scale ratings of how scenic places are, they are based on um, photographs. So photographs of the places rather than somebody having taken some monster road trip over the entirety of the, of, of the country is, you know, but, but plus is we've got more ratings from more people as, 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 a, as a result, but it's of the photographs. And so then, yes, that brings in um, a number of, of, of issues. You know, there might be something temporary in the picture that isn't there normally. Um, might have been a sunny day or a, or a dull day. There's lots of things where a photograph is going to capture a perspective at a particular moment in time. Um, and there are various ways you could argue that, that that might not be representative. Now, what helps us, however, around these very valid um, considerations is the nature of geograph. So first, um, Geograph gives us loads of coverage. Um, so so we, can, we can pick up multiple photographs to get more perspectives and, and, and um, aggregate the data across those multiple photographs. Um, and also Geograph, the point of Geograph was to be a project that documented what places look like. So people who've contributed to Geograph have been incentivized to just take a picture of what the place looks like rather than submit their best ever photograph or not photograph a, a non-scenic area, for example. Like you get a point because you, you've got an area. So if it's not scenic, you, you, you still get your point. Um, and so that, and, and then on top of that, there is a wonderful team of moderators who moderate every single geograph photograph. So even though we've got millions of photographs, somebody's checked them all to make sure, you know, they don't have any people in them. They really give you an idea of what the place looks like. So it's really a different quality to if you just got some, some photographs off um, social media, um, for, for example. So yeah, there really are things you need to think about that if you're working with photographs rather than actual ratings from the, the location. But Geograph is, is an amazing resource um, for the UK and we're lucky to have it for the country and that does help mitigate some of these concerns at least. Well, that is all the questions that I see in the Q&A and it also um, takes us nicely up towards the end of our time. Um, some really fascinating stuff in there. And I've got a list of websites I'm definitely going to be reading more about, checking out some tools, and really impressive uh, what you've done with these large um, large data gathering and, and, and I guess linking um, linking these things through place and time is, is really, really, really great work. And we're really pleased to have um, heard you tell us about it today and, and really want to thank you for taking part and all of our audience members for taking part 
um, in today's uh, today's talk. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a real honor to speak here. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much again to the speaker, the host, and everybody who asked questions. And we look forward to seeing you again sometime soon. Thanks and bye-bye. <laughs>